Hello, welcome to our episode six. Chapter six is the second interview. This is the second interview we had with Loy Factor. Enjoy the story. Chapter six, the second interview. Mark and I prepared to interview Loy Factor for his second time, my first. I listened repeatedly to the tapes of the first interview and then carefully prepared a list of questions. I also began to read a mountain of assassination books and articles. The more I read, the more Loy's account of the assassination seemed plausible. The readily available eyewitness testimony suggests more than one person was on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository building. Earlier I referred to Arnold Rowland, a young married man who was in Dealey Plaza with his wife to see the motorcade. He stated that he saw two men on the sixth floor, one with a rifle, minutes before the flurry of shots struck down the president. But Roland was not alone in this observation. Carolyn Walther, waiting for the arrival of the president at a position on Houston Street, noticed two men in an upper story window of the depository about five minutes prior to the assassination. One of them wore a brown suit coat. The other wore a white shirt and held a rifle in his hand. Now, over here, Dan, still on Houston Street and not very far from the Rollins, was Mrs. Carolyn Walter. Mrs. Walter says that she saw two men with a gun in the book depository. I looked at this building and uh, I saw this man with the gun. And there was another man standing to his right. And I could not see all of this man and, and I couldn't see his face. And the other man was holding a short gun. It wasn't as long as a rifle. And uh, he was holding it pointed down and he was kneeling in the window or sitting. His arms were on the window and he was holding the gun in a downward position. Like Roland, she assumed that the men were part of the president's security detail. Another witness, Richard R. Carr, a steel worker, reported seeing a man wearing a tan sport jacket and horn-rimmed glasses standing in a sixth-floor window minutes before the shooting. After the shooting, he saw the same man walking away from the scene on Commerce Street. Ruby Henderson, who was across the street from the depository, recalled a similar scene as the above examples. Two men. A prisoner on the sixth floor of the Dallas jail, John Powell, stated that he, along with other inmates, observed two men on the corresponding floor of the school book depository building, one of whom appeared to be Latin. The bulk of the evidence seemed undeniable. At least two people were on the sixth floor shortly before the shots were fired at the president, and one of them is often described as dark-skinned. Loy Factor was a dark-skinned Indian, and the man who hired him was also described as dark-skinned. We hope to find out more about the man who recruited Loy. Who was he? What was his name? And who was the young Latina? How did Jack Ruby fit into the picture? We wondered if Loy would be willing to divulge these details. Loy greeted us from his wheelchair as we entered his humble mobile home, situated on a rural northern Oklahoma farm. A light snow was starting to fall while Mary, Loy's wife of five years, stoked up the wood stove and asked us to sit down. This was my first meeting with Loy Factor. He seemed older than his 67 or so years, probably due to the hard life he had lived, but also because of his fragile physical condition. In addition to heart disease, he suffered from diabetes. In 1964, one leg had been amputated below the knee and recently half of his remaining foot had been removed. He spent his days in a wheelchair, 
relying on Mary and his sons to care for him. He appeared comfortable with Mark, but somewhat unsure of me. Together, Mark and I assured him that his decision to relate the details of his knowledge of the assassination was the right thing to do. He needed the occasional encouragement that we would give him. He said that he'd spent many hours pondering over what to do. It would have been much easier to deny any association with the assassination of President Kennedy, but he knew that it was important to come out with the truth now while he was still alive. His recent illness and hospitalization had made him think seriously about many things, especially the events of 1963 and the murder of his wife five years later. He apologized for having turned us away at the hospital, explaining that he had been startled by the visit and was simply too weak and sedated to deal with any more questions at the time. In his memory was locked away so much that needed to be told. Boy felt it was an omen that Mark and the other researchers showed up as they did in his hospital room. He had been thinking soberly about what he was about to tell us. Loy called it studying. He said, I sat here the last few nights studying all that went on back then. The name of that man that I met in Bonham was Wallace, and the girl, her name was Ruth Ann. Mark and I looked at each other. We had come to the right place. For the rest of the day, Mark and I sat in Loy and Mary's living room, listening while Loy unfolded his story. He had so much to tell us that we had to slow him down and carefully focus our questions, as he tended to ramble. He was extremely hard of hearing. Also, it was sometimes difficult to understand what he was saying, but well worth the extra effort. We wanted to know more about this man and woman that Loy had referred to as Wallace and Ruth Ann. What did they look like? He described Wallace as a dark-skinned man, about the same coloring as himself. And Loy was a medium, dark-skinned Chickasaw Indian, but looked somewhat Hispanic. Wallace spoke both Spanish and English, and Loy assumed that he was Cuban or Mexican. He pointed towards me and said that Wallace was about my size, at that time six foot, about 200 pounds. He didn't know if Wallace was his first or last name. He was just called Wallace. How old would you say he was? Mark inquired. He was older than I was. I was about 35 or 36. How much older? He looked about 40 or 45, I would guess. What about Ruth Ann, the girl? Ruth Ann was about 20 years old, Loy estimated. He was definitely Hispanic, very pretty too. The first time he saw her was a few days before the assassination when she drove into the factor's yard and notified Loy that Wallace had sent her to pick him up. She was a very nervous young woman, cold and preoccupied with her mission. With her was another Hispanic young man who Loy had never seen before. He couldn't remember his name, but he too spoke Spanish. They were edgy and unsure about Loy and rarely spoke to him during their days spent together. Ruth Ann appeared to be second in command to Wallace. Loy's first meeting with a man at Sam Rayburn's funeral was also discussed in detail. Had the meeting been just a random event? Loy seemed to think so. The man simply moved over to where the Indian was standing, waiting for the president's arrival, and attempted to start a conversation in Spanish, assuming from Loy's appearance that he was Mexican. He appeared to be alone. Would he be able to recognize the man if he ever saw him again, we asked. Oh, God, yes, was Loy's animated reply. I'll never forget that man. Did he say anything about Kennedy in your conversation with him? Did he express any hatred towards the president? No, he never said anything about that. He just said Kennedy didn't have much security and you could probably just walk up to him real close. 
You talked about how close he thought he could get to the president. Yeah, and I said he could get shot real easy by someone in the crowd. You told me in the hospital that you bragged to him about being able to shoot, Mark added. I told him I hunted and fished, Loy said. But did you discuss your knowledge of guns with him, Mark asked. Yeah, I think that's why he told me he could use me. What kind of a person did you think he was? Well, at first Juanita and me, we both thought he was a good man because he gave us $20 to buy something for the kids. I thought he was rich, and I told Juanita that he might have a job for me. Loy Factor's manner of expressing himself was childlike at times, very simple, like the man himself. Sometimes he was confusing in his explanation of things. It was the same simple-minded way of his that caused the jury to eventually convict him of manslaughter at the word of his stepdaughter. His mental abilities were never fully understood back in the 1960s when terms such as learning disabilities, attention deficit disorder, and similar handicaps were not understood. Part of a Johnson County Capital Democrat newspaper article of that era helped in our understanding of Loy. Quote, Not much is known about Loy Factor. He has a metal plate in his head as a result of a shrapnel wound, according to a brother, Factor was a veteran of World War II, and in June 1948, the Veterans Administration said he was incompetent and entitled to receive compensation in the amount of $60 per month. But a guardian must be appointed before the monies would be released. His mother, Annie Holden Factor, then filed a petition for appointment of a guardian to manage his business affairs. Since 1950, Eddie Blanton of Milburn has acted as Factor's legal guardian. Factor's checks from the VA were increased to $76.75. He is a skilled woodsman, hunter, and fisherman. Likes living in the woods and sometimes took his entire family out of the house to live for long periods in the woods. The family's house is a run-down affair but a new house was being constructed for Factor under the Indian Housing Construction Program in progress at Fillmore. Factor had his left leg removed below the knee during surgery at Johnson Memorial Hospital in June 1964. He was bitten by a copperhead snake in 1957 while working on a ranch near Milburn, and the wound never healed. He had many admissions into the Veterans Hospital in Oklahoma City and the Indian Hospital in Tallahanna for skin grafts, which did not take. Factor is a diabetic, and wounds of the extremities are difficult to heal of those with the disease. Following surgery in Tishomingo, Factor was admitted to the Veterans Hospital in Oklahoma City again, where he was fitted with an artificial leg and received physical therapy until he learned to walk again. This is from the Capital Democrat of October 10, 1968. Sitting in his living room, listening to him speak of these old memories that he had tried to bury, we realized that his guilt must have been so heavy that he had convinced himself that he was not really a party to the assassination of President Kennedy. He would continue to distance himself from the shooting, trying to convince us that he was merely an observer, a standby, not really connected to the crime itself. There was a barrier that we were never able to quite break through. We were never able to extract a statement from Lloyd clearly explaining his specific role in the assassination. He would become very vague and withdrawn when the subject was broached. Common sense and all of the surrounding circumstances seemed to point to the Indian as one of the gunmen on that day. But Loy was never able to verbalize that. He was like a child who refused to admit to a wrongdoing, even when the evidence was obvious. It was Juanita's idea to go to Rayburn's funeral, Loy said. The service was to be held on Saturday, November 18, 1961. She asked Loy how far it was from Wolf City to Bonham, as they had often been to Wolf City to buy seed. Together they decided to take the kids 
and go see President Kennedy. Now, looking back, Loy figured that Wallace had been stalking the president on that very day, working out a plan that would come to fruition almost two years later. Mark and I had the distinct impression that Wallace, whoever he was, recognized the Indian as an especially suitable pawn in this dark plan. For here was a man who appeared to be not only naive and simple-minded, but a crack shot. Easily manipulated with money, the dirt-poor Indian could have just as easily been the expendable member that Oswald proved to be. In his chance meeting with Factor, Wallace must have instantly seized upon the idea that Loy was the type of person he would need some day. According to Loy, there was no further contact by Wallace until approximately a year later when he drove to Factor's Fillmore home. Loy walked out to meet the man and was invited into the man's car to talk business. While not remembering the details of their conversation, the substance was that his future employer wanted to see for himself the shooting abilities of which the Indian had bragged. After getting his 30-30 rifle, Loy and his visitor went to a nearby clearing to shoot at cans. Wallace was greatly impressed by Factor's marksmanship, and repeating the story he had told earlier, the deal was struck between the two men. Mark then asked Loy, Did you know that they were going to kill the president? I figured they was going to shoot someone, but they never told me who it was. You never knew that Kennedy was their target. Not until the very end. Some might find it hard to believe that Loy would involve himself with Wallace and his group and not know who it was that was going to be killed. But this was the story that Loy Factor stuck to right up to his death in May of 1994. Ruth Ann, Loy assured us, was one of the key people in the group. She knew everything about what was to happen. She helped plan everything, I think, Loy said. She picked you up at your place, I asked. Her and this other fellow, I can't remember what his name was. What kind of a car were they driving, do you remember? Loy thought hard, looking upward and shaking his head slightly. I couldn't say for sure what kind it was, other than it was a station wagon, and it was rusty, kind of rusty color, maybe brown. Are you sure it was a station wagon? Oh, it was a station wagon. I don't remember if it was a Ford or a Chevy or... How about a Rambler? No, it wasn't a Rambler. But Ruth Ann drove, right? She did all the driving. When anybody went anywhere, it was always her that drove. But when Ruth Ann and this other man drove up to your place to pick you up, what did they say? I asked. She just introduced herself and said that Wallace had given them orders to come and get me. She said that they didn't have much time, told me to pack some stuff and get going. Did she tell you to bring a gun? No. What did Juanita say? Oh, God, she cried and told me not to go with them. She didn't want me to go because she knew that man was up to no good. Why did you go? I wanted the money, he said in a lowered tone. Were you afraid? Hell yes, I thought they might kill me. His expression about his fear of being killed reminded me of something I had read in one of the newspaper articles. We read that someone did try to kill you while you were in Tishomingo jail, I said. I flipped through a folder full of research information and handed him a copy of the Johnson County Capital Democrat article dated October 16, 1969. Quote, Shooting of Factor in Jail Proves a Puzzler. News Note. Lawrence Factor, while being held in the Johnson County Jail, was shot in the arm about 4 a.m. last Friday by an unknown gunman. Who shot Lawrence Factor in the arm before dawn last Friday morning and brought a temporary delay in his trial for murder? Was it an enemy of Factor? 
a friend of Factor, or Factor himself? Now that the trial is over, perhaps some of the mysteries will be explained how Factor came to receive a superficial wound in the upper left arm from a spent 32 caliber bullet while he was supposed to be in a cell in the unattended county jail. Factor told Sheriff Herman Ford and Wayne Worthen, investigator for the district attorney's office, that about 4.30 a.m. Friday, he was attracted to the window of his cell by an unknown young man's voice calling, Mr. Factor! A light was on in Factor's cell, and he could not see who was out in the dark. If the shot came from outside the cell, it came from outside the walk-around fence, about 15 feet from Factor's window. There were no tracks between the fence and the jail building. The bullet passed through without nicking a diamond-shaped steel mesh only three-quarters of an inch wide at its widest point, which covers the cell window. The bullet then passed through a cardboard container of hair grease, supposedly sitting on a steel ledge connecting bars over the window. Before coming to a stop in Factor's arm without even entering the muscle, the bullet was removed while at the hospital here. It was shot from a poorly rifled gun. Lloyd laughed out loud as he read the clipping. If it wasn't for that royal crown hairdressing, I might have been a dead man. Did you have any idea who it was that shot you? He explained that it might have been Debbie and her boyfriend Sam Davis, or maybe just someone who wanted to avenge Juanita's murder. It was also possible that some member of the conspiracy was sent to kill him. But I don't think it was them, because they wouldn't have missed, the Indian noted. The specter of Lee Oswald being shot down while handcuffed in the Dallas jail came to our minds as we listened to Loy. Whoever it was that tried to kill Loy that Friday morning will probably never be identified, but the similarities can hardly be ignored. It is a rarity in American society for a man to be gunned down while in police custody. But if that man has sensitive information capable of injuring important people, then a way will be found to silence them, whether in jail or not. Getting back to our point of departure, Mark asked, So you were afraid of them killing you if you didn't go along with their plan, right? That's right, Loy assured us. So you packed a bag? Yeah, a duffel bag. Where did you go then? We took Highway 48 over and then down to Dallas. We stopped in McKinney to eat. Did they talk to you? Tell you about the plan or anything? No, they mostly talked to each other in Mexican. They didn't trust me much. So you still didn't know the whole plan, not until you reached Dallas. No. We drove to this little house I told you about. That's where all of them went over the plans. On a Dallas city map, Loy tried to show us the area where he thought the house used by the group was located. He remembered it being only several blocks away and northwest of the Texas School Book Depository building. Now that area is covered by commercial buildings, but there once was a residential area there, according to Dallasites we talked to. Our hope of Taking Lloyd to Dallas and reconstructing many of his old memories was never realized due to his weakened health condition. Do you remember if it was raining around the time you went to Dallas, or if the roads were muddy, I asked? Lloyd thought it might have been raining and that the rural roads in his area were muddy at the time. Lloyd's home was located in an area of Oklahoma located near the Texas-Oklahoma border. The Red River forms a natural border between the two states, and the soil in this Red River Valley is known for its unique red color. When it rains, automobiles are often covered with this bright reddish mud. The reason I asked Factor about this was prompted by a reference I had read in the Warren Commission report regarding a couple of suspicious automobiles covered with red mud in the area of the assassination. Mr. Lee Bowers, a railroad employee located in a 14-foot railroad tower, spotted three cars in the railroad yard area shortly before the assassination. 
Two of them were covered up to the windows with red mud. Another car, with no mud on it, was driven by a man who apparently spoke into a microphone as he drove around the parking area immediately behind the grassy knoll. One of the muddy cars was remembered by Bowers as being a 1959 blue and white Oldsmobile station wagon. When you arrived at the house, who was there? Wallace was waiting for us. And this was two days before the assassination? That would be November 20th, Wednesday? I think it was two days. Did you stay at the house overnight? Yeah, I slept there a couple nights. Wallace stayed there, Ruth Ann and the other fellow stayed there too. When did Ruby come to the house? He would come by every once in a while, two or three times. Was Oswald with him? A couple of times. They were together, Mark asked? Yeah. They all discussed the plans together? That's right. There was a big table at that house, and Ruth Ann, she drew out these diagrams and maps of where the cars were coming from and which way they was going to go. Oswald was in on that meeting? Yeah, a couple of times. Always with Ruby, though. Do you remember the drawings and the maps? I didn't get to see much of what they were laying out on the table in there. It was laying out on this table, and they would gather around the plans on the table. Lloyd demonstrated with his arm gesturing. You say they all spoke Spanish? Did Oswald? Yeah, some of the time. Did Ruby speak Spanish? I don't think so. What part did Ruby play? I don't know, but one day he came in and he was real mad, and he tells Ruth Ann, the route's been changed, the route's been changed. You was worried that the route was changed? What day was this? I think it was the day before. So what happened? Ruth Ann says, I'll be back in a while. I'm going to go check it out. So where did she go? I'm not sure, but she came back in a little while, maybe an hour, and tells everyone that the route's the same. No change. What did Ruby say? He told Ruth Ann, you better make sure everything goes right, otherwise we're all dead. So what Factor witnessed in this pre-assassination time period was Ruby becoming rattled by some rumor or report that the whole motorcade would skirt by the depository, out of range of Malcolm Wallace and the sixth floor team. Was there a reason for Ruby to become agitated? Yes, for although one of the two Dallas Daily newspapers announced the correct route to its readers, the Dallas Times-Herald, its competitor, the Dallas Morning News, described the route incorrectly in two of its editions. On Friday morning of the assassination, the latter published a diagram that eliminated the zigzag turn onto Elm Street altogether. It is entirely possible that one of these wrong news reports is what so startled Ruby into doubting his own inside information. Did you ever talk to Ruby? No. How did the others view him? They all respected him, I think. But he wasn't actually part of the assassination? No, I don't think so. Ruth Ann, she did most of the planning, I think. She knew everything. Was Jack Ruby with the group at the time of the shooting? Not with us. I don't know where he was. But he obviously had some knowledge of the motorcade route. He and Ruth Ann both, because she left the house to check on the route and then told Ruby it was okay, no change. Do you think Ruth Ann had more authority than Oswald or Ruby? I think so. It was her mainly, but Wallace was the one in charge. Now, on the day of the assassination, how did you get to the depository building? Ruth Ann drove, and I went with her. Just you and her? Wallace and Lee were already up there. They were both already in the building? Yeah. Then what did you do? She parked the car, right? Yeah, behind the building. Facing which way? East, I think. Then what did you do? I followed Ruth Ann into the building. How did you enter the building? There was a back door. 
So you went in through the back door. Did you see anybody with you when you went in? Didn't see nobody. After you got into the building, where did you go next? We went up some stairs. Mark pulled out a clean piece of notebook paper, and after drawing a large square representing the building, he asked Loy to mark where the car was parked, where the back door was. and where the stairwell was located. The Indian obliged. He drew a small rectangle at the rear of the building, an X indicating a door near the center of the north side of the building, and then pointed to the upper left corner of the square, indicating it as the location of the stairwell. So the stairs were in the northwest corner of the building? Yes. And you followed the girl up the stairs? Yeah. How far up the stairs did you go? We went to where Wallace and Lee was. Were they on the sixth floor? I think it was. What time was it when you got up there? It was just a few minutes before the shooting. Ruth Ann was in a hurry. She was afraid she was going to be late. Did she have a gun? No. Did you carry a gun up there? No, but when we got up there, Oswald was checking out one of the rifles. He was looking through the scope, you know, and then he handed it to Wallace, said, It's okay. It's ready to go. How many rifles did you see in the building? There was two. One was a Carcano, the 6.5 with the scope? That was one of them. The, the other one didn't. It didn't have a scope? Do you remember what kind it was? I think it was a 30 odd six. What kind of action? Bolt action. But no scope? That's right. Wallace used which one? The one with no scope. You said Oswald was looking through the scope and then handed the rifle to Wallace, right? Yeah. Then he leaned it in. It's kind of like a table saw. He had it all ready to go. What was Ruth Ann doing? She was talking on a walkie-talkie. Was she looking out the window? Yeah. Which window? There were lots of them. Who was she talking to? I don't know. Were there other shooters somewhere outside? She was talking to someone on that walkie-talkie. I don't know who it was, probably that other fella, referring to the unnamed Hispanic companion of Ruth Ann. Did you hear any of what she said or what was said to her? I didn't hear. I was too scared. You say Oswald had a gun. Wallace had a gun. Ruth Ann didn't have a gun, but communicated with someone on a radio. That's right. What did you have? Did you have a gun? I didn't have nothing. Were you supposed to stand guard, watch for someone coming up the stairs? What was it that you were told to do? They wanted me to shoot, but I told them I wouldn't do it. Loy was boxed into a proverbial corner and was now forced to deal with a very pivotal detail that he had been trying to avoid. What was he doing up on the sixth floor of the Dallas School Book Depository Building in association with two assassins, and a radio operator seconds before the President of the United States was to pass within a few yards of them. To believe Loy, we would have to accept that he was just standing there with no gun and no job to do. He was simply there. Wallace told me if they missed, I would be the backup. Loy was beginning to look tired. Mark suggested that we take a break for lunch and resume in another hour, to which Loy and Mary agreed. We drove into the little town of Tonkawa and found a small diner. Our lunch discussion was centered around Loy's denial of any participation in the assassination. He was not about to change his position. What does he think, that we're idiots? I asked Mark in a frustrated tone. I mean, here's a marksman who has been tested by Wallace 
paid money to shoot the president, accompanied the team to the ambush point, and then what? Ask nicely to just stand by in case they miss? And then what was he supposed to do? Run over to the closest shooter, grab his gun, and fire off a few more rounds? Stinks, doesn't it, Mark said. I'll tell you what I think. Mark shook his head in agreement, knowing exactly what I was about to suggest. Bottom line, Loy was one of the shooters. That's what he was paid to do. That's what he was brought to Dallas to do. Talk about someone in denial, Mark said with a smile. That's what he was doing, though, Mark. He's either blocked that horrific act out of his mind or he's simply trying to convince us that he was just there for backup. If it were me, Mark added, I would have shot over the president, intentionally missing. Think about it. How would anyone know who missed and who hit their mark? Well, at least that would have been a lot more believable. Maybe that's what he did do. There were some shots that supposedly hit the grass, right? True, I said, but that's not the story Loy's giving. He wants us to believe that he was just a backup shooter without a gun. There's one other way to look at it, Mark offered. How? Maybe, just maybe, it happened precisely the way Loy said it did. Yeah, right. Loy factor, utility shooter. Exactly, Mark exclaimed. Loy figured we would believe the scenario because he believed it. What if Loy was duped into being on the scene with them? Maybe he was the one who was supposed to get caught by the police with a smoking gun. What if he was the expendable one? If he had been killed by the police while trying to escape, well, end of manhunt, end of story. Again, we decided not to argue the point with Factor, but for the time being, until we got more information to confirm or deny his actions, we would go along with his explanation. We resumed our interview with Loy by reviewing the pre-lunch part of our interview. Loy again repeated the standby shooter scenario. When you went up the stairs with Ruth Ann, how many minutes before the shooting was it, I asked. I would say just a few, maybe five. Did you or anyone in the group stack boxes? No, the boxes were stacked before we got there. When the motorcade came towards the building, where was Oswald? He was at the window with his gun. Where was Wallace? He was by another window. Do you remember which one? Near the middle, with another rifle. Yes, that's right. Sitting or standing? He was standing back from the window. She told us not to get close to the window so no one would spot us. Where were you? I was over by Ruth Ann. She had this walkie-talkie, like I said, and she was signaling with her arm and counting like one, two, go, and waving her arm down like this. Loy moved his arm down quickly three times as one would do in starting a race. So she was signaling for the shooting to start. That's right. Where were you and Ruth Ann standing? Over by the end window. The west end? Yeah. I looked over at Mark, who was leaning forward, literally sitting on the edge of his seat as Loy recalled the scene on the sixth floor. What happened next? Ruth Ann counted, one, two, go, and both of them shot almost at the same time. Then Ruth Ann and I ran down the stairs. It would be important to note at this point that the location that Factor says that he and Ruth Ann were standing affords a commanding panoramic view of not only the gunman on the sixth floor, but also the entire area of the so-called grassy knoll and stockade fenced parking area and the railroad overpass. There would be no better area to coordinate the shooters, especially if there were another shooter in the grassy knoll area. If you ever get a chance to visit the sixth floor, stand in the southwest corner window and experience the sight for yourself. As soon as the first shots were fired, you begin running. That's right. 
I followed Ruth Ann down the way we came, and we got into the car and drove away. Did you see anyone on your way down or out of the back of the building? I didn't see nobody. Everyone was out front. Were there more shots after you ran out? Yeah, there was a big commotion, but I don't know how many. We was running out of the building. Where did the other two go, Wallace and Oswald? I guess they went down the stairs behind us, but I never saw them because Ruth Ann and me ran out first. So where do you think Wallace went? I saw him about an hour later with Ruth Ann. You saw him and Ruth Ann together? That's right. After Ruth Ann and I left, she drove me to the bus depot like was planned, and I was waiting for a bus, and in a little while, the two of them comes back to the bus station to get me. So the plan was to drop you off at the bus station, but then they changed the plan and came back to pick you up? That's right. They said they had to get me out of town because things was getting too hot there. And that was an hour or two after you were dropped off? That's right. That was when Oswald was arrested, Mark said. Did they say anything to you about Oswald being arrested? I didn't know about that until I got home. So they drove you home? Well, we was headed up through Mead, and that car broke down right outside of Mead. I think the clutch went out. What did you do then? Well, I just hitched it out of there. I never saw those two again because I got a ride into Durant and then I went over to where my friend Johnny Green was working at this toy factory. He was making, you know, making Christmas toys and he took me home after he got off work. Did they pay you? Ruth Ann paid me my money before I got out at the bus station. How much did they give you? I think it was 8000 because Wallace paid me 2000 earlier. So the last time you saw Wallace and Ruth Ann, they were broke down outside of Meade, Oklahoma. That's right. I never saw them again. Our interview with Loy continued well into the early evening hours, and Loy was becoming fatigued again. We had taped over seven hours of conversation about the assassination, details of his family history, his military experiences, as well as the murder trial. Before leaving, we made an agreement with Loy to correspond by mail with him as questions were certain to come up. We were tired. Loy was tired. But it had been an extraordinary day. <laughs>